Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2022-23 Nats Chat season. I'm Kari Reagan, moderator of Nats Chats, which are sponsored by Inside View Press. And I am so thrilled to start this season off with these two fabulous people, Dr. Clifton Ware and Dr. Amelia Rawlings-Bigler. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. And it's such an important topic, voice uh, voice class, right? We I haven't done a Nats chat on this topic, and uh, I can't wait to to uh, talk about it with you and kind of unravel some of the challenges and, of course, the many advantages. To begin with, I would like to just start with Dr. Ware. You have a wonderful song that you're going to share with us. So would you yes, please? Yes. <laughs> I insist that you start that way, actually. Okay. This is the way I introduced myself since yeah. 1960, 1960, what, since I was 60, 60 <laughs> years old, we had a celebration concert, and this song was composed at that time, 25 years ago, <laughs> oh, for okay. aging, the aging singer, we call it, yes. and I need a pitch. Yes, I'm an aging singer. I've sung all over the place. Whatever I sing, most anything, I proudly keep my pace, performing with such grace. With a high note, oh, and a singing, I will go, performing with such grace. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> I love that. It's such a great way to start not only the season, but the discussion tonight. Uh, and we're going to get into a little bit more of, of your background um, in a moment here. But Amelia, do you want to just introduce yourself? I know you're familiar to a lot of the Nats members, but for those who are maybe new to our Nats chat, Yes, I'd love to. Thank you, Kari. Um, I'm Amelia Rawlings-Bigler. I'm currently at Coastal Carolina University in Conway, South Carolina, very close to the beautiful Myrtle Beach. And um, yes, I know many of you through research and symposia and all of the things. So I'm really excited to be here with uh, Clifton Ware tonight and with Kari and look forward to all of our discussion. Uh, thank you, Amelia. And so, Cliff, I have to, as I said earlier, you know, I'm a little starstruck. I, of course, have had your books on my uh, shelf at home. And, you know, to have this opportunity to speak to you with your esteemed career uh, is just a, such an honor. Would you share just a, a little bit about your background with us? Oh, gladly. Uh... I've been at the University of Minnesota for 37 years, from 1970 to 19, 2007. Mm. So 37 years. It was a great career. The last five years were spent in a phase-out retirement at a quarter-time load. And I okay. taught only pedagogy classes, along with a vocal pedagogy certificate I formed. Mm. And 25 graduate students made it through that certificate in the five years. So I was very proud of that. It was a great way to teach, you know, a quarter time, come on, you can do other things, you know, and just do what you want to do. So yeah. that was a wonderful way to phase out. Yeah. And then retirement came and I was, I was ready for it. I took two years off from teaching voice, uh, pretty much. I, we did sing in a 50s group. We formed a band with our family and a few others and had fun doing some crossover singing. But uh, I, we're going to talk about this later, so I won't go any further. But I got my doctoral degree at Northwestern University in 1970. That's when I came here. Okay. And uh, you were going to ask me about adventures in singing, right? I, do, I would love to. That's a perfect segue. Thank you for doing my job for me. I would love to head right toward talking about your books. I mean, you are a... Um, prestigious published author and of course your pedagogy book is one that m most people have had on their shelf it's um so yes would you and i am so sorry because i'm not home i cannot hold up your wonderful book so if you don't mind sharing them with us and orient I all of my books here i appreciate <laughs> that i couldn't leave this out now okay so i got started writing and doing scholarly type work on three doctoral theses in connection with three recitals at Northwestern. And that 
really was an in-depth experience in writing because they're really three theses. I can't believe that, you know, it's like dissertations. And I did one a year for three years, the last three years I was there, along with the recitals. So that got me started. Then in 1980, when I was teaching at the university, uh, Roy Schusler, my mentor and voice teacher for a while and boss, retired from teaching class voice. I took it on for the first time and really enjoyed it. That went on for, well, it's gone on ever since that time, pretty much. But about seven years later, in, in 87, I got the idea it was time to write a book that I thought would, would work for my classes. So we came out with this book, Voice Adventures. Okay, can you see that? Mm -hmm. And along with that was 14 songs recorded by my wife, Betty, and a DVD, uh, no, not a DVD, I'm sorry, this was a, a VHS. Oh, <laughs> do you remember those? VHS. I do. <laughs> so that, that went along with the, the text, you know, and I used two of our um, PAs were featured on there. And one funny part was when uh, the female was lying on the floor. And the camera comes on and she just she's down on the floor. It was just it brought chuckles every time because it was she was down there for a breathing exercise. But anyway, that, that's the one thing I remember from it, just thinking back. Uh, so from that, in in 87, we, we published our own book through Harmony Publications. And then serendipity struck. Paul Knuckleby, a, a book agent from St. Paul was in the bookstore at the university, came across that book, Voice Adventures, wrote me, called me, I finally gave in and we met. And he said, we agreed that he could look for uh, a contract. He contracted several publishers, among them McGraw-Hill. And that was by far the, the more prestigious one of the two that we decided were the last finalist. So we went with McGraw-Hill and the first publication was, uh, there were two contracts, one for the pedagogy book and one for the voice book. Okay. So I did this one first. This was the first edition. I like that copy, the cover, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. Um, there were two more that came along and in 2008, this one. Okay, yes. that's the one with it. I don't know if you can see all the people in there. At first, I thought this was a weird cover, but I really got to liking it. Yeah. Kind of cute. So in the meantime, in 1998, I finally finished the pedagogy book. So I was doing all this at the same time. It was, it was a, a very busy period in my life. Yeah. Then that was over. And I can talk about some other books that came along, but the one that really applies, well, I forgot to show you this. This is Adventures in, in Singing, published in China. Oh, that's, that's bigger. great. Yeah. And Sudong Abramsa was the one that did the translation for it. I certainly couldn't do that. So uh, do we talk about the pedagogy? Okay, here's the pedagogy yeah, book. Please, because this that. is one, yes. That's the pedagogy book. Basics yeah. of vocal pedagogy. And this is the Chinese version. Oh. I don't know if it's selling over there or not. They never tell me anything and I get no royalties that I know of. <laughs> so, but I was, you know, so that's pretty much it except for Paul Knuckleby formed his own company. And in 2005, we published The Singer's Life. I don't know if anybody has seen this one, but it's, it's a good book. It, it has yeah. several chapters in there that uh, it, the singer's philosopher, his vocal athlete, his, you know, all those things. So it kind of summarizes the singer's life. And I think, okay, then 2008, we published The Aging Challenge. Oh. Making the most of life after 50. Okay. And a uh, pretty good book <laughs> through the same publisher, Birch oh. Grove. So I think that's enough. Like, well, we did make this is the bad, the good, and the ugly. It's a DVD that is a parody on vocal styles. We have the country singer, the uh, hooter, the crooner, the belter, you know, and the dark voice opera singer, oh, 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 you know, that voice. But I made fun using 
uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, variations of that song. Oh, thank you, Cliff, for sharing all that, because that, I mean, it's such an accomplishment. I mean, it really uh, is. So I appreciate you taking time to walk through all of those. And would you share with us what led you then at this point to, to develop the Clifton Ware Group Voice Pedagogy Award, of which Amelia was the first recipient? I'd love to hear a bit about how that came about. Well, I had in my will to give an award, not award, to give a grant or a donation to Nats upon my death. But I changed my mind and decided that I really wanted to give something. And I thought it would be the, uh, the intern program, which mm -hmm. I was the first coordinator and host for in the early 90s. Oh my at the university and uh, it was a wonderful program it was terrible the year i did it because i didn't understand that they really wanted to help better singers than i came up with i came up i was a voice class teacher a lot and i i thought they wanted some real vocal problems you know so i had these students <laughs> lined up and these these interns came in and they they wanted voice majors you know good singers so i really i blew it on that oh. but otherwise it was a great start uh, so I want to do something for the for that program. I mm -hmm. thought it'd be good. To, and we started talking uh, between Bob, Brian, and uh, Brunson, my, yes. and myself, Karen. And we decided that group voice was something that I really enjoyed. And could that be a part of the intern program? So it really started out being a part of the summer intern program, just having some something happen with group voice. And from there, it moved outside of, of that, beyond that, because we thought that it should be open to everyone, not just to the interns, because it was supposed to be just for the interns to start with. So that's how it got started. And of course, Amelia was the star. I mean, out of 22 applicants, she was just up there at the very top. And she was my number one choice, along with two other people, a committee of three people, uh, including Karen, who's in charge of it. Mm -hmm. uh, came up with a list and I and we had five total. They agreed with my three plus two more, I think it was. So there was some very good talent in there, fine people, but Amelia just stood out, heads and shoulders. And I've asked her if she would be willing to have that application made available to the Nats membership uh, for future applicants to see, so you have an idea, a model of a very yes. good uh, presentation, very scholarly and yes. her her project was wonderful. She can tell you about that later. Yeah. So that's how we kind of jumped around here, but that's no, that's, that's perfect. perfect. No, that's perfect. And uh, yes, I had the privilege of reading it myself this week, and I agree with you. It was just beautifully written uh, with scholarly information uh, and a deep passion for teaching group voice. So that was very evident. And um, you know, we're grateful that you were willing to work with Bob Bryan who is helping our organization learn about advancing through fundraising and yeah. find he's a wonderful I, guy isn't he wonderful yeah he's yeah been such a great asset to nats we're grateful so amelia that leads me to you we've already now we've heard a little bit about your a wonderful application but what led you to apply and tell us a bit about that process from your perspective Sure, I'd love to. I, I've always had a long time interest in group voice teaching. It began through my undergrad degree in music education. Uh, I ended up double majoring, so I really enjoyed my music ed classes, my choral classes, conducting classes, getting uh, people to sing together in a group. I really found that really worthy. And then my uh, mentors at the time, Ann Benson and David Bankston, connected me. They actually provided for me to go to a workshop with Clayne Robison out at Brigham Young University and do his vocal beauty boot camp. So I went out there and was just astonished at the results that he could get in, in a very short amount of time with, with singers who, uh, you know, like Cliff said, really needed some work. We're, we're really working from the ground up. Um, they weren't just great when they showed up. So I was really impressed with that and started to study sort of his methodology and everything. I then ended up at Penn State for my master's degree and as part of my uh, graduate teaching fellowship was teaching class voice using Dr. Ware's wonderful book. 
uh, right. to mainly instrumental music ed majors. And I ended up putting together a before and after reel and just found that the students, I even had two or three go on to have voice careers and or become primarily voice educators in some way. And from those classes, and I just thought, wow, I felt like I was really making a difference. It was very fulfilling. And from there, I just started developing my own methodology for group voice teaching, uh, working that in my independent studio as well in, as in my academic career. I started offering a course called Technique Tuesdays, which is basically group voice workouts uh, online before the pandemic. And uh, the students loved that, uh, group voice online. And then uh, multiple voice foundation workshops, Nats workshops, and that led me to apply for this award that Clifton so wonderfully and generously donated. And so uh, when I saw this award advertised, I thought, oh, wow, this is perfect. This is literally, if, if there was any, any research award for me, this is it, right? So um, I applied for it and um, I knew there would be many wonderful applicants because this field is rich with, with people doing this work. Um, but I offered a couple of research studies in group voice singing that I have in the works. One was a, a shorter term, four week qualitative study on the effects of group voice teaching, uh, both small group and large group. And uh, then that moved into a larger longitudinal study that I'm running now on uh, a mixed methods study. And then also a historical study I have in the works and a simple survey, survey method study that is also going to be coming out soon. So many projects, but in an area that we have great anecdotal sort of um, evidence, but we don't have a ton of research. So. Mm -hmm. That's what I hope to provide. And again, I'm super passionate about it. You can probably tell that yeah. I get excited. So yeah, that's sort of how I came up on it. Well, we'll look forward to having you back after the other side of the research to talk about some of the evidence you've uncovered. That'll be wonderful. I love yes, that. I actually um, just presented one, the first study for ICVT this summer. So that was, that was incredible. And I'm excited to publish those results soon. So be on the lookout. So the last several months, you've uh, been able to collaborate with Cliff uh, as part of this project. Tell, tell us a bit about that. Well, first, just being able to be connect with him has been phenomenal. I did not, I did not have any relationships. You know, I had not spoken to him before or met him. I had used his undergrad voice pedagogy textbook in my class. So it was one of those things and used his group voice textbook. So it was one of those things where, like you said, I was a bit starstruck when he emailed me after the award, this beautiful email. And I thought, this is, I felt the same way when like Ingo Tiza, when I met him, you know, I'm just these, these giants in our profession who we owe so much to. And so when he emailed me and offered to meet with me and just talk about my interests and give me feedback and, it was a little bit like I had met Celine Dion, if I'm being honest. It was amazing. <laughs> um, and so we've met a few times to discuss sort of the research, uh, the current things that we can work on to develop this area. And his guidance and support has just been completely invaluable. Um, his rich perspective from his own work and his long time work in this profession is just something that I'm just so privileged to be able to have access to him and, and to pass on these things from him. Well, you'll well, be a great ambassador. You'll be a great ambassador for this award as it moves forward. So that's wonderful. Well, let's dig into some of the nuts and bolts about uh, advantages and challenges um, found in group voice teaching. And let's begin with the advantages. Let's start with the positive. And I just want to open this up to to both of you since you have a a rich history in teaching group voice and, and are both so passionate about it. Just kind of share some of what you see as the advantages of why someone might choose to uh, explore group voice from the teacher and the singer perspective, really. Amelia? <laughs> well, it's pretty short for me. It's more effective and it's more efficient, full stop. Uh, it just saves a tremendous amount of time from a teaching perspective, if, if done in a really effective manner. Um, I've also seen it, students improve much quicker. 
because they are getting feedback from other students throughout the class. They're able to uh, confirm the feedback that I'm giving um, or, or say, no, I didn't hear that, you know, and, and we have a discussion. So it's just, it's very effective and very efficient in terms of teacher, teacher use and time. And Clay Robinson even mentions this in his book, uh, Beautiful Singing, that they did a, a study there at Brigham Young and the students improved three times as fast. Uh, when they had group class as opposed to just one-on-one -on -one training. So yeah. it's really important. It's an important topic. And I feel like in general, we're kind of group voices kind of pushed to the side as the one for the avocational singers or instrumental music ed or music therapy majors. And based on this study that I just ran, it was integral to my students' success last semester, just those simple four weeks with students who had never had group voice training before, majors, mainly musical theater BFA majors. So, Cliff. I lost my notes. <laughs> I printed them off and the dumb machine ran them off backward or something. I've got them all screwed up here, so I don't have my notes. But I found that the systematic approach of having a lesson plan that follows a step-by-step -step progression from beginning to the end, beginning with the vocal process, the motivation for it, the respiration, so forth, all through phonation and articulation and expression. And so just, helping students understand how the voice functions on a very simple level and demonstrating with exercises how to get the proper breathing for instance because i think you agree that most people breathe incorrectly when you ask them to take a deep breath it's <laughs> you know the chest heaves and the and the diaphragm pulls in instead of relaxing and going out so i found out working in front of a group with individuals going through the breathing process with all of them really drums it in. I mean, they see the difference, they hear the difference. So it's the reinforced learning that I think is extremely important in group voice. The other thing is I, I consider group voice a kind of a therapeutic group. It's a therapy group. Uh, you become very supportive of one another. You learn how to give critiques in a very humane, kind way, thoughtful. Uh, so in the process of, of sharing, I think everything, and even your weaknesses are going to show up as a singer. Everything you're doing is being criticized, either by the teacher or by the students. But if you can keep that at a level that is always loving, that's always, I try to keep it humorous. You know, I make fun of it, uh, it with students, and I, I don't think I've ever had anybody cry yet. <laughs> so I think I've, I've done okay in that regard. But I do think that approach that you use with students is extremely important to keep that group dynamic going and people satisfied with what's happening. The other thing is tempo. Uh, voice classes should not be stuck on one student. If you start giving too much attention to a master class situation with a student, it just doesn't work. You've got to to keep things moving. You've got to keep the song literature short, I think. Mm -hmm. I always, all the songs in my book are less than two, fewer, less than two minutes in length. And that's on purpose. And they're, they're simple enough that most people can learn them. And the other advantage in, in the repertoire, well, I'm jumping around here, but students hear the, those songs sung over and over by different people. Their, their repertoire base is expanding. So from a pedagogical point of view, all these, students who think they're not going to be teaching voice are really learning pedagogy yep. uh, by observing. Uh, you don't get that in a private lesson if you're not listening to other people. It's just you're too isolated. And there's nothing wrong with a private lesson. I think they're very important, especially at a certain point, and maybe contiguous with the, the class voice, which is ideal. Um, so the systematic instruction, the uh, dynamic social aspects, the cost factor. Okay. It's a great way to build a private studio. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can start, you can have voice classes. You make a little bit more money, perhaps, if you do it right, if you have enough students. Like, I would have no more than six to eight students, ideally. But okay. uh, most classes in college, I think we had to have 15 or 16 at the university. And it's mm -hmm. just too many. But yeah. that's what was required to, to keep the money coming in. Mm -hmm. But cost-wise, and I think recruitment-wise, it's a wonderful way 
to, to get students into a private studio. Mm -hmm. um, what have I left out? I mean, you did a great, I'm looking at your notes thinking you just did all of that off the top of your head and you <laughs> followed. Um, yeah. Well, I was, think I left something out, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, evaluating and assessing achievement can be easier. Yes. Right. The evaluation, because you have, everybody's got the standards. This is what you're supposed to do. You know, you're supposed to memorize two or three songs and everybody knows they've got to compete to do that and, and do it well. And you've got to have maybe, a, I like the journal idea, journaling about keeping up with how you're doing your thoughts about the process, your problems, and even logging your your vocal, your time spent in practice. So you, you can look back and see as a student, oh, I didn't do so well last week. It's kind of like the apps we have. Hey, we need an app for the, the iPhone. It tells you how much you're practicing, not just how far you're walking or running or biking, <laughs> but you know, why not? <laughs> uh, okay, Amelia, take it on. Yeah, Amelia, anything to add with the? Yeah, I think those are all great points. And I think, you know, Cliff touched on the pedagogical side of this in that we've talked often within Nats and the voice pedagogy community that we just don't have enough time to teach applied voice teaching in our pedagogy classes. Most of us have one class for the un for undergrad, if that, okay? Um, and so what I've started to do is really my upperclassmen, as we're working, I'm using them to give pedagogical feedback, to work with students, to talk about what did you hear there? Uh, what exercise would you use? Lead the group in a warm up. Um, what do you think would, what do you think anatomically, physiolog physiologically and acoustically would create that, that that inefficiency that we might work on. So I found that by the time they leave that course, the course with the, all of the group teaching, they're essentially great, really good voice teachers. So I, f I just find it so instrumental in that. Um, and Cliff also talked about the number of students in the class. So uh, tip, the, the study that I'm running now, uh, on Mondays, we have large group class. That's everyone in my studio. So right now that's 10. Normally it's more it's more than that, but I'm teaching uh, class voice as well this semester. Uh, and then on uh, they have their one-to-one -one lessons of 45 minutes on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And then on Friday, we have small groups of three and four. So I have three small groups that I've hand-selected them uh, to be in these groups together. And uh, the hardest, the thing that I found the hardest was the buy-in at first. Mm -hmm. simply because most of them have come up thinking that group voices for the avocational singer, they, they need their one-to-one -one attention. It's most important, you know, and as soon as they experience it, they are sold. I mean, that that's the study that I just presented. That's exactly what we found was they were very tentative at first. They were really nervous to sing in front of others, to make mistakes in front of others. After the very first large group and small group class, their numbers were nine and 10, interested, interested, interested. Um, they do not want to give it up, especially the small group. They really enjoy the small group. But I will say with the large group, that's my time each week to talk about big concepts like music study and how to warm up and how to do certain things, you know, big concepts, technical concepts that then we can explore in each of this, the following lessons. So it's been incredibly successful. And honestly, I don't think I can go back. <laughs> And you're talking about, this is in the academic setting that you're talking about. Tell us if, if you're an independent teacher, um, like Cliff said, it's a great way to build a studio as an independent teacher. So let's talk a little bit about how it looks different in the independent studio than maybe in an academic setting. Yes, I actually, I did this first in an independent studio. So um, with my uh, side teaching, um, of my independent studio, what I found is that I had a lot of students who they needed more, they needed more repetitions. So they would come to their one-to-one -one lesson, but they're, many of them are pre-professionals or professionals, and they needed a time to just simply do a voice workout. So I started offering these technical, Technique Tuesday classes and group work, mainly larger group work, but I've also done smaller group work, and it gave them an affordable option. So for $15 or $12, just like they can log on to Broadway Dance Company and take a dance class virtually, they can do that with singing and get some really great feedback. And again, there are strategies. Uh, some people might say, well, with dance, you can see everyone. With voice, if they're all singing together, you can't hear and give feedback. 
there are ways around that, very effective ways. Um, is even it, It's actually almost more effective on Zoom uh, mm -hmm. at this point because everyone's muted. And then I can drop in and hear and mute and unmute. And it works really well that way. So it, gave, it gives them an option that's a little less expensive. So they have more access to you. They have more instructional time. Uh, and then they can always take a one-to-one -one lesson as well. So, and again, with small groups as well, having them where they may have a, a shorter one-to-one -one time, and then they're working with that small group. And it's it, every time I've offered it, the students rave about it. They love it. Um, so again, it's just getting them over that hump a little bit with the buy-in and mm -hmm. offering a free one to start off with and then showing them what can happen in a group is a great way too as well with an independent studio. I love that. So let's talk about some of the challenges then. What are some of the challenges that might uh, present, especially if somebody is either new or considering teaching group voice or they already are? And, and this is a great opportunity too for the attendees to use the question box if, if you have a, a question specifically about how to facilitate. But let's talk about the challenges. Um, Cliff, would you like to lead off? Oh, did we lose his sound? Uh-huh. Oh, sorry. No, I go ahead, Cliff. I think you're no. Wait, I just oh goodness. Amelia, are you, you're not hearing him either? I cannot, no. Okay, I heard a little scratch when you touched the microphone. Right. Um, yeah, um, we're hearing yeah, that. Might be connection. So there may be a connection thing. We tried without headphones a few minutes ago and it didn't help. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, it must be, must be my earphones. Head Okay, well, so okay, is the sound okay though? Overall? Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Brilliant. Where were we? There was challenges. A... The challenges, ironically. <laughs> yeah, the buy-in that uh, Amelia mentioned is is probably the biggest problem. Getting, especially voice majors who think that they're really hot stuff, and <laughs> and also if the other teachers are not sold on it, uh, and mm -hmm. if they've never taught class voice, I think you have a, a problem. In getting some faculty to go together and understand how important class voice can be, even for the best singers. Mm -hmm. And so I have, I've always said that the, every freshman should be in a class voice the first semester or quarter. And uh, that brings everybody together, it brings a, it makes a esprit de corps of your voice students. They come from different studios, they learn to co collaborate together and cooperate. That's very important in building a, a good feeling in the, in the department, a community. You know, mm -hmm. so I think that's a, a, a problem. The other thing is the timing. Uh, mm -hmm. Some students need more time and the, they need the one-on-one the -on -one time. To do repertoire that's more than two minutes long, more challenging. So that, that would be a problem for a really talented student. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they have the private lesson along with the, the class, that problem is solved. They get mm -hmm. to do the advanced repertoire as well. Uh, anything else, Amelia? Yeah, I think definitely um, just the overall management of the class is really important because for me, I want to really strategize to give them the, as many repetitions of the concept as possible. They are singing as much as possible while also balancing my ability to hear them individually and give feedback. So there are some really uh, great classroom management techniques that you can use. For instance, uh, I'll have them all stand in a, in a semicircle with me in the middle, you know, at, and at the head of it. And I organize them a specific way by voice type, also by level. They don't know all of this unless they watch this webinar. But I, I organize them that way so it's more effective as I go down the line. And so I'll say, okay, number one, everyone. Number two, everyone. Back to number one. Seven, did you hear what so-and-so? And of course I'm using names, but, but I'm able to go very quickly with limited downtime. So I almost keep a steady beat and we don't stop which gets them into a very flow-like state. They're making sounds, they're playing, they're doing all of this without stopping and thinking and talking, talking, talking. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's really important the way that that's done. Um, and also just understanding too, that group voice pedagogy is not the same as one-to-one -one pedagogy. How many of us were trained in how to teach in groups? No. Um, so we just were kind of figuring it out. And I think there are many teachers out there, even right now, who are trying to do this. They recognize the benefit or they've been assigned a class voice in their university and they need strategies, they need training for this. And it's it our one-to-one -one voice training is voice pedagogical training is not necessarily going to apply to the group honestly most of the the things that i've found most successful are things i've come up with on my own or that i learned from my music education background and choral mm -hmm. conducting background so um those are just a couple of the of the things that can be challenges but i will say that every challenge can be turned into an advantage very easily so i, love I don't want to discourage anyone from trying this there's a couple of great questions. Um, Margaret read my mind. She says, do the students all sing the same rep in the group class or are students bringing songs they have been working on in their own time, so more of a master class? It depends, I think, on, on what kind of a class you have. My community education class, for instance, that we've taught for the last, since 2009, <clears throat> I allow them to bring songs into the class and uh, it gives me a, a a way to see where they are and what their style of preference you know is that kind of where they are musically by just let, letting them sing and some of them are pretty gosh awful i mean it's hard to sit there and say oh my you know how am i going to approach this so believe me i've had more experience teaching real beginners amateurs who have no idea what this is about than probably anybody, <laughs> but I, I love it. It's, uh, I wanted to say that for me, class voice is the most flow experience I can, yeah. I've ever had. It's better than performing. It is performing, but it's better than a, a concert in many ways. Two hours goes by and, and you know, it's just been a pleasure. I'm pooped at the end, but uh, <laughs> I really enjoy that. And, uh, I think it's because you have to keep your attention cannot falter like it can in a private lesson. You have to keep going. <laughs> do you find that, Amelia? I do, and I was gonna I was gonna comment too about the repertoire suggestion. I agree, Cliff. It totally depends on on the group. Um, what I found most effective is that I've developed uh, sixteen eight to sixteen bar cuts from all different repertoire. So we might do music of the night, and then we turn around and do Jesse J, bang, bang. Then we turn around and do just anything, art song. Um, and, and not only, like Cliff said, it, it broadens their knowledge of the repertoire that's not just classical music, but all repertoire. Um, it also has them develop different vocal skills. And because you're using a shortcut that works a specific concept. Like often I'll use where or when because it has an ascending line up to a high G. So they're able to work registration. You can work the acoustic changes, all those things through that one cut. Uh, but they also learn the repertoire and you can work it in many different ways. I also use, for instance, the edge of glory challenge where I can transpose it or I'll take one phrase from think of me. I'm using a lot of phantom tonight, uh, but think of me and use that approach to the high note and then transpose it up and down by half steps as an exercise. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm constantly using that. And then I also have them in masterclass format. I'm not a huge fan of masterclass format because you don't get the students get very bored uh, because it's not. Their, the attention is not on them, so it has to be done in a really specific way to be effective. But what I've done is they pick their own songs, they give me three choices from different genres, I'm able to compile repertoire, and then I copy those songs or get, get access to those songs for study purposes to the class. So I can easily, we all learn the songs. So I can say, you know, Susan is up here performing, let's, hey, sing line five. Okay, Susan, you sing it. So it becomes another another repertoire learning experience where no one is just sitting in front of the class in master class format for 50 minutes, which mm -hmm. I found just to be very ineffective. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I, I should add that, excuse me, I'm sorry. I should add that in the academic setting, I used my book, of course, uh, another book, but they had to use certain songs from the book. They couldn't bring other stuff in outside of that because I wanted everybody to be following along. Mm -hmm. You know, open their books and 
and sometimes we'd sing them as a group. Mm -hmm. You know, amazing grace. We'd maybe let everybody sing that just to talk about different voice styles and how to sing it, more legato and so forth. So I think there's, it depends on your class, the purpose of your class. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of technique and breathing, all that, that, that applies everywhere. Would you agree? Uh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a, and this is a great uh, time to ask this question. Uh, Leslie Jones asks, um, is there a new edition of Adventures of Singing or a new text from <laughs> Amelia coming up in the near future? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, McGraw-Hill kind of ran out on that. They, you know, I, I've learned a lot about the business. For one thing, everybody, even then, lived all over the country. And it was hard, email was about the main connection. They were all part-timers, I think, very few. The uh, the people in charge of the voice area changed. The main, the person who I contracted me changed. So it was always in flux. I don't even know the people now. Uh, you know, there's still some royalties coming in, but they're little bitty <laughs> compared to what they were. And uh, very few copies are being sold. The other thing that's really messed up is the digital versions. They're selling a, a song here, a song there. So it's all piecemeal. And the books are too, too expensive. I mean, I, I look at the prices. I can't believe the prices. of the, So I can understand people not wanting to buy them. But um, I was asked if I want to do another edition. I said no. I mean, it's hard work, folks. <laughs> I, I think a song anthology is the hardest thing to write because you've got every song and every song has every note. You have to you have to look at every detail for the whole for six how many songs? Sixty songs? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's it's just it's too much detail. Very mm -hmm. hard work. But uh, uh I'm glad well, you have <laughs> I want to share with you a couple lovely comments for you. Um from Elizabeth Murphy says uh, that she wanted to say thank you to Dr. Ware, that she's used Adventures in Singing for a group voice class for many years at Arcadia University in the Philadelphia area. And um, and Dr. Murphy says thank you wow, so much. Thank you very much. That's wonderful, Dr. Murphy. Yeah. Appreciate and that. And then from our wonderful Karen Brunson, wonderful information and applicable for all ages tonight's chat from both of you uh, can be concept useful in choral settings, studio classes with a, with a social component as a group learning opportunity. Thank you, Cliff, for highlighting this. Wow, yeah. thank you, Karen. That's wonderful. Uh, so nice. Now, yeah, we've got... She's a wonderful person. Isn't she? Yes, we are filled with wonderful people in the Nats organization. It's just amazing. Yeah. Uh, there's some fabulous questions, quite a few. So let's see if we can kind of power through okay. some of these for people. Um, Cynthia Vaughn says, what do you do, a, a non-music major who has trouble matching pitch, what do you do in that case in group voice setting? Amelia. <laughs> well, I, I have had this happen many, many times, as I'm sure <laughs> Cynthia has as well. Um, what's really helpful is again, the group, it's very important where I place that student. So when I do sort of a beginning diagnostic with the whole class and ha hear them sing or do a couple exercises, I'm sort of, I'm going to put that person by a really, a person that's got a strong ability with pitch. Um, I oftentimes will say, uh, okay, Susan, you sing. Okay, Kari, match Susan, right? If especially depending on the voice type, if it's a lower tenor bass baritone, a, a lot of times they're having the pitch issue matching me. So if I have them have someone match it within their own pitch range, that helps. We also do lots of pitch exercises as a class. Um, pitch matching issues are destigmatized. That that happens in the group because they realize, oh, I'm not the only one who has pitch matching issues. That so and so over there has it too. Um, and eventually it just becomes fun. We all laugh. You know, we'll be going down the line and, and they know and they'll sing something completely out of tune and they'll go, I got it, you know, and so we'll go back and do it again. And so, uh, again, all these inefficiencies or pitch matching issues become destigmatized um, in the group, which is very helpful. And also working the function of the voice helps the pitch oftentimes. So, again, figuring out whether it's an ear issue or whether it's a functional issue is helpful. Does that change okay. online? Like how do when you're dealing with an online group voice? Mm. Is 
you have any ideas or strategies in that circumstance? Yes, I've worked it many times the same way. I've learned now, believe it or not, how to play. And, and my friend Ian Howe was going to tell me, quit using Zoom. I don't have to worry about this. But um, I can now play the exercises with the delay in time for them. I've just gotten used to listening and playing it opposite. <laughs> Um, I also have them use things like a guitar tuner app where they see, okay, I'm supposed to do C, D, E, D, C. Okay. If the guitar tuner app says D, F, A, okay, that's not, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. So they'll match the voice and it's an external feedback, uh, thing for them to use to match pitch. Okay. And wasn't there, I'm sorry, I don't think I've read it because I don't deal with that uh, clientele for pitch matching. Didn't Heidi Moss just last year or two years ago, isn't there an article that she recommends certain apps for helping with pitch matching? Yes. Oh, yes. So for Nats, remember, Nats yeah, look up the Nats Journal, Heidi Moss. Uh, I think it may have been a year or two years ago. Maybe she's on here and will say something. What I would um, like to say about that is, and I'm sorry. No, please click. I don't recall having any monotones or people had real pitch problems. Uh, you, I, I would really, really have a hard time thinking of someone, but I, because I think a lot of the times they're solved by the key. If they're yeah. low voice yeah. and you put them in the wrong key, they just can't even hear it. And that's mm -hmm. what you were saying about in the speaking voice. They're mm -hmm. accustomed to those pitches, I think, in their speaking voice, so they can match pitches probably better in that range. But yeah, the key makes a big difference uh, for a lot of voices having trouble singing in certain pitches. Mm -hmm. Especially the developing voice, I think that's true. Right, yeah. So, uh, so here's a different question from Christine. A concern that she has is that, um, sorry, I'm, uh, she's not the greatest pianist, uh, which is why she's not a choral director. So can a flawed but expressive pianist be successful with group voice class? I love that. Look at that positive spin. Absolutely. Yes. I can't play with a flip. <laughs> I'm so glad that my wife, who's sitting over here listening, is my pianist for life, and she can join me in these classes. Otherwise, I'd be completely lost. And that, that's my one failure as a, a vocal musician is that I never had enough keyboard. And I, it's been a drawback. I, you know, I'm sorry about that, but that, but on the other hand, it pushed me more toward other areas, especially mm -hmm. vocal technique and so forth. I think I put my energies mm -hmm. in that area. Mm -hmm. So, no, yes, you can absolutely teach. You may have to use it, you know, you've got these, a lot of good song anthologies, including Cynthia Vaughn's, mm -hmm. that have uh, the accompaniments, and you know you don't have to, and you can probably even transpose them. I'm not sure what they've got these days, but what do you do, Amelia? Yeah, as I tell my students when they send me practice recordings, I say please do not send me a recording of you practicing piano because they'll send me. I'm telling, having them do exercises, and I hear. And then I, they spend 20 minutes working on could they get the one three five of that chord and that key. <laughs> I say, no, do this half step. That's it. That's all we need. Um, I do not use the piano that much when teaching group voice. I typically want to be walking around the room. It's more right. engaging. That's typical music education concept. So mm -hmm. I will use hand signs. I'll say bum bum. I'll sing it. Um, I'll snap and keep the steady beat while we go around and I'll just go up and they know that's a half step. Uh, so there are many ways around that. So do not let that discourage you. They can use tracks to perform uh, with time marking so you can easily find the start of a verse or a chorus. There's just many ways around that. So absolutely doable. Great answer. Good. Are the class members of the same voice type or do you have a mix of men and women? Mix. Yeah. Yeah. All voice types. I have my large group is all is a mix of voice types. Uh, for the small groups that I'm running right now, they are similar voice types within that group. But for instance, like I have a group of three treble voices. One is primarily a belter, hasn't done much legit work at all. One is prime coming from the other side, almost all classical training, and the other one is kind of in between. So I'm finding different things technically with them, but they are relatively the same voice type for the small group. But it could be the other way. There's no 
I just chose that because of the repertoire that I was choosing. Yeah. It's a good um, way to, to teach an aria, for instance, if you have three sopranos, have them work on the same aria yeah. and uh, they learn from one another, the reinforcement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that, Do you have many, you have three in that class, your small class? Yes, three, I have um, three, three and four. That's good. So, yeah. Yep, and they're different yeah. levels. I chose it that oh. way on purpose. Mm -hmm. And from Kate Rosen, uh, she has an assignment for a 25 person group boys class. Ooh. What thoughts <laughs> can you share with her about, about teaching a group that large? How can we help her? That's a choir. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I think I'd do a lot of stuff together. I'd yep. have all the sopranos, you know, do something and have them point to one after the other, and let them sing different uh, sections, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of what you're doing, Amelia, with your group, right? You, you let them sing different sections of a song. Right. And I, um, I do, I go out and work with choirs a lot, choir teachers, especially K through 12 teachers. Uh, on this exact concept, how can they bring group voice to their choral classroom and really train the voice vocally in the in the classroom? And so it's very much like this, like Cliff says, it's a choir. Um, I would recommend duets. They could work on duets together, shorter duets, so that there there's some individual singing. Um, uh, definitely having them sing as much as possible, but isolating, like like Cliff just said, one part of the song, everyone, one part of the song, everyone, back and forth, uh, pairs. Um, I think that could be incredibly effective. It can be done. It can be done with 25 people. It's yeah. not optimal, but it can be done. And uh, at the college level, how does the group voice affect your vocal faculty low credit load? How is it calculated? In other words, do you guys want to speak to that? Amelia? Yeah, so... Yeah, so right now, um, this is just this longitudinal study is just part of my teaching load. I am teaching the same amount of hours I would have taught had they all been one to one. So they're they're getting uh, typically they would get an hour long one to one lesson and a one hour studio master class. I've now turned that into a one hour um, group, large group, a 45 minute one to one and a one hour small group. And it's the same amount of time divvied up. This is part of this research study I'm running now is would they be willing to have even less one-to-one -one time if they had more group time? They're they're being asked this question throughout this study. So we'll see. Um, the question when I asked it this past for the for the shorter study, uh, they wanted all the things. They wanted like three hours one-to-one, -one, five group classes a week, four, you know. And I said, no, we can't do that because of teaching low credit. But um, many of them were willing to to go to a 30-minute lesson a week or a 60-minute lesson every other week, as long as they could keep their two group classes. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Yeah. So if someone were new to te teaching group voice, what broad advice, what advice that we haven't already touched on? Is there anything specific that you might share with our audience that you think would help? I think of attending a, a voice class taught by a good teacher or several teachers, mm -hmm. at least at the beginning and the middle and the end. Of a, of a class to catch what's happening and how much progress is being made and what, what the basic techniques are. But I think the main thing is to, to really observe a lot of good teachers. And mm -hmm. that's one thing we could do in NETS, I think, is to have more workshops with teachers and, and, and people observing to see, you know, to have a, a mock class consisting of the, of the teachers, if mm -hmm. nothing else, just so they can experience what it's like themselves. By the way, I did on, on the I had a voice practicum and the on the vocal pedagogy certificate. And we would have three grad students teaching two private students, students who are maybe in orchestra or some other part of the college. But we had a hard time coming up with all those students and getting the, everything coordinated. But they would teach a private lesson every week, and then we would come together for an hour. And they would work with their students, and I would give everybody would give feedback. The other thing is the teachers would also perform for the class, so that the beginning students were hearing really good singing, you know, from their teachers. And so it was an exchange of teachers and students. 
And I thought that I enjoyed it, and I think that they did too. It was mm. a good experience. Yeah. Are are there any recorded group lessons that people might be able to watch to see oh. ideas about, about yeah. how to structure something? Do you know of anything out there? No, but that's that's what we need to work on on the affinity group. That's yeah. Yeah. perfect what, segue. We need to have a whole <laughs> library of tapes that people can watch. Okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a minute as we near the top of the hour. This the affinity group that you're going to uh, form, the Nats Affinity Group for Group Voice. Yeah. Amelia, you want to talk about this? Yes, or? we're we're really excited about this, and this is a perfect segue um, because the with Nats Affinity Groups, we need ten people who are highly interested in this in this topic to start an affinity group. Right now, we have five or four, I believe. So one part of this webinar is just a call to action a bit that if you find yourself and you're one of these people who want to join us in this effort, um, we would love for you to email both of us or one of us and we can share it with the other one uh, to start this affinity group. We definitely, we, we see there's a, a real issue with getting the training out there with resources. Um, some of that I'm working on, by the way, I am working on a textbook. I've got it right over here in a box. So it's coming, whoever asked that question. <laughs> um that's my that's my big thing right now but we also need like videos we need lots of different resources so if you are interested please reach out to us um maybe we can you can find our emails i'm sure easily online but we could also maybe put them in the chat as well uh for this exciting affinity group yeah could yeah. you talk somebody's asking what is an affinity group can can you back up a little and share yeah special interest group yeah a sub subgroup within that and will it be run, will you create a Facebook group as part of that? Or right now they just need to contact you of your interest as you get this initial group together? I think once we get the 10 people going, we can discuss what to do yeah. beyond that. But I could mm -hmm. see a, 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 an annual summer workshop um, where all the group voice people come together and teach for one another. Do we, do we, uh, you know, videos of those taping, uh, yeah, tape them. Um, there's lots of possibilities. And I don't know why I didn't think about this earlier. <laughs> well, you've it's thought a, of it now, so that's wonderful. It's yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful way to, to go about it. That's great. Yeah. And somebody's asking, when would the group meet? I think they're, they're just at the initial stages of finding the 10, people or so that are going to be interested. So um, right. they email um, one of you directly, or how do you want to do that, Amelia? Do you yeah, they come to both of us at the same time, if they don't mind, just copy to Amelia, both of Amelia, you in the, um, maybe in the chat box, put your yes. email and, uh, and um, yes, and they can contact someone at Nats and we'll make sure. And while she's doing that, so look for that in the chat box, everyone, there'll be some information coming to everybody. Uh, while she's doing that, I, can you tell me, Cliff, when is the deadline for the award for this next year in case there are people on here who will be interested? I'm not sure, that will be announced. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we haven't talked about that yet, but- uh, okay. Okay. Sometime in the winter. Yeah, probably February or March. Okay. Do you remember, Amelia, when you received the information? Oh, I think that it was due in either April or March or April. Okay. Yeah. And Alan is telling us, everyone, uh, if you go to nats.org, put affinity groups in the search box, and you will find information on all the affinity groups. Thank you, Alan, for that. I uh, didn't should have known to have suggested that. And let me just make sure if there's anything else that I'm missing. Um, yeah, so Leslie, if you're interested, please contact them and, and don't, yeah. I think open that door and see um, if you if it's the right fit. Well, I can't um, leave this special time with with Dr. Ware on here without asking you just a little bit about how 
as somebody with your history, how do you think we're doing as a profession? You know, as somebody who's written a pedagogy book, you know, how how are we doing now um, from the I outside? I think we're doing superbly. Nats is a, so many programs have, have grown, increased, been added. I mean, like the affinity groups, the mentorship program. Um, the publications are excellent. I mean, the, the Journal of Singing has held up beautifully. It's, continues to maintain a very high level of scholarly information. Um, the Nats chat, of course, <laughs> but you are, did you organize this? Yeah, well, it started long before I did, and it was online, and then I took it into the webinar format. Well, it's a wonderful addition, and uh, internos, you know, I just think the diversity within Nats has grown too. The crossover singing, uh, you know, the commercial, the private studios are getting a lot more attention, I think. So some very good things have happened. And uh, I'm sorry I haven't been very active, but uh, as you know, I've been giving my time to sustainability issues because I'm concerned about how we're doing. I'm also concerned about how Nats and how professional singers and the whole profession moves toward un doing something to make a contribution to what's all this information that's going on right now. Songs about nature. Um, there's so, so much we can be doing, I think. And, uh, but I don't, I don't see an awful lot of activity in that area. Am yeah. I wrong? I mean, no, and I, yes, if you want to expand on that, because I know this is where you're putting your time and energy right now. And I, I think you're the same passion you, you gave to voice, you're now giving to the sustainability issues. Well, you know, the world is becoming so complex and everybody's having to be a specialist. We don't have many generalists anymore, which means that we don't have many people that can see interconnections between everything. Mm, you know, we just don't see how everything is built from the smallest atom all the way up to, to what we're doing today, the complexity. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to see that picture and try to take it in. But that's been my main goal is to try to understand the relationships between the environment, the economy, the mm -hmm. equality. Mm -hmm. you know, there's uh, an energy and energy is just everything is we're learning and without mm -hmm. energy we have nothing and so we're feeling the pinch right now because energy is at a peak level mm -hmm. and we're seeing the results of our profligate ways of over consuming and wasting nature extinctions going extinct sea levels rising we've got some real problems mm -hmm. and i know music and, and singing can help relieve that it can help make people more whole you know give us something that's really fun to do, worthwhile, helps us to, to develop work on ourselves, our personalities and our way of thinking about things, to be more mm -hmm. sensitive. So I think we have a role to play, mm -hmm. but I just don't, I, the problem with my modernity and modern people is we are separated from nature to almost completely. Everything we do is pretty much indoors, in cars. We don't spend time out talking to the trees, hugging the trees, and and being aware of all the animals and how many we're losing. Mm -hmm. through. It's, it's really scary, mm -hmm. and I hate to be a part of it, but I have been. I've mm -hmm. been a consumer, I've used my share of energy, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I did enjoy it. You know, it was, it was a wonderful ride. For those of us who are getting toward my age, we've seen the, the peak of all the energy and everything. And so I hate to leave that, my grandkids and uh, the future stranded. So if we can do something about that as a profession, it would be wonderful. I love that. And I, yes, I mean, that's a big call that that would be a, its own uh, affinity group, I think, wouldn't it? But in yeah, the meantime, yeah. I think we are so lucky to work in a profession where we do get to add to the beauty in the world and we get to sing about some of these. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, that you talk about, so it's wonderful. 
Well, it has just been an honor and a thrill to, to uh, share this time with both of you, and I can't thank you enough. I think this is such an important topic, and I know there will be uh, lots of movement. It sounds like a textbook coming and, and an affinity group, so lots to look forward to. And I want to uh, just remind everyone, our next Nats chat will be November 13th with Angelica Nair. We'll be talking about articulation and psychoacoustics. Because she's in Europe, it'll be at a special time at 12 Pacific Standard and three o'clock Eastern Standard. So I hope that everybody will join us for that Nats chat and look at the entire season online. And uh, if you're not already on our Facebook book group page, and that's chat for voice teachers, please join that. Thank you, Dr. Ware and Dr. Rawlings Bigler for joining me tonight. Thank you, Kari. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Kari. Good night, everyone. Good night. Cheers. <laughs>